All right. This week, we're going to be talking about the financing contingency and specifically the financing contingency in use with the 22AR, which is the notice of um, financing waiver. So first of all, the financing contingency is, in fact, a contingency. Um, so it's going to create protections for buyers and obligations for sellers. We'll be discussing the process of which the financing contingency should be used, how to properly use it, and how to make sure you are following the rules to keep your clients protected under this contingency. We will also be talking about how and when it is waived and what does and does not constitute a waiver of this contingency, as well as ways we can leverage this for a stronger offer in a competitive market. So first I wanted to open with a question just to think about while we're talking about these. And that is, can a buyer come to the closing table with more than the minimum down payment without penalty? And the answer is yes, of course they can. So with the 22A, there are several other forms that are used in conjunction with it. So just familiarize yourself with some of those. Um, with the 22A, we're going to be talking about the 22AR and AC, but when it comes to the appraisal provision, you will see forms such as 22AD, 22ADN, and the 22AWO. So what does it matter? Like, why does it matter the way we fill this out? This contingency is a contract to make application on the loan type and the down payment noted in the agreement. It absolutely matters that they actually apply for the loan that they've specified. Not applying for this particular loan type will initiate an automatic waiver of their financing contingency. In other words, the buyer is promising to make application for this type of loan and must not deviate unless they've been given consent. So what we're looking at here is not a disclosure. And because it's not a disclosure, we have certain obligations that need to be met. So the first one is talking about the loan type. When you make loan application, you're going to want to select the loan type that they're going to use. Now, they've actually added the home equity line of credit in here, as well as the down payment assistance program. The one that is chosen is the one they must apply for financing with. Um, the down payment noted should be around the minimum down payment, um, but whatever they do on here has to match their approval letter. Making application is the key in this though. It defaults to five days. So for the purpose of this conversation, I'm going to go ahead and just assume that it's at five days. So before the five days are up, um, the buyer must make application from the bank for the loan they've specified with the down payment they've specified, and that cannot change. In order to make loan application, they will need to provide the property address, the buyer's name, proof of income, potentially a social security number. You're gonna need the purchase amount and the loan amount. They can always put down more than the minimum down payment if they decide later, but the approval should be based on what the minimum down payment required is. Now between the mutual acceptance and those first five days, it is possible for the buyer to go ahead and change lenders, but they may not change loan types. So what happens if they don't know what loan type they want? Um, if you see multiple boxes checked, this indicates that maybe they don't know exactly which loan type they want to use. But what it means as far as the contingency goes is that they have a contingency out for any one of these types of loans. They don't have to apply for all of them. They only have to apply for one of them. Um, so you'll really want them to kind of narrow down and pick what they want to do. Um, they should be specifying all of these, sorry. Okay, so what happens if they do change their mind? What happens if 
they maybe don't get along with the lender um, or they change their mind on what type of financing they want to use. Well, they are allowed to change their lender within those first five days. They are not allowed to change the loan type. So if for some reason they have done that without consent, they are risking a waiver of their financing. Um, a waiver can happen with any one of these reasons. If they fail to make financing application within the first five days, if they change the amount or change the loan type, I'm sorry, without the seller's consent, or if they change the lender after the five days. If you have a buyer who wants to change any of these things, um, we do need written permission from that seller. So you get written permission with Form 22AC. Well, how do we know if our buyer is actually complying? Uh, well, as the buyer's agents, we want to stay in contact with the lender. What we want to do is we want to see that pre-approval letter and we want to see their actual application to make sure that the loan amount is the same type that we've written on the contract and make sure the down payment is the same that we've written on the contract. We also want to make sure that they have made that application within five days. Now, sellers do have the right to communicate with the lender so it would be advantageous if sellers would also go ahead and double check the loan type, the down payment, and the application date. Anything that needs to be changed must be changed on a 22 AC if it's done after those five days. So I pulled up the 22 AC. This is how we get permission. Um, we have uh, any, like I said, anything after five days, if the buyer fails to do this, it does constitute a waiver of the financing contingency. Now, in order to do this, you want to know where they're going to be applying for if they're changing lenders and what type of loan they plan on applying for if they're changing loan types. The whole idea of the financing contingency is an umbrella protection for the buyer to give the time to make that application and get all the finances under, you know, under control and move towards a smooth closing. Now, all contingencies have the option of, you know, having the a, an obligation for that buyer, but also a right for the seller. So in the financing contingency, after 21 days, the seller does have rights. Um, 21 days in, if this, if this is not changed for the default, the seller does have the right to ask the buyer to remove the protection of their financing contingency. At this point in the transaction, everything should be moving forward towards closing. Their application should have been completed. Um, they should know that they are approved for the loan amount and maybe have ordered appraisal already. Um, at the 21 days, the seller has the right to give notice to ask the buyer to remove the contingency protection. So are we doing that as listing agents? Are we telling our sellers about the rights that they have for removing that? If not waived, this contingency does go until closing. Box number one actually creates a, an action that the seller has to take in order to get this done. So it's kind of the um, the most conservative way to think about this. It, may, it puts everything back in the seller's hands to initiate this conversation. If the box is checked for the appraisal not being waived, then even if the financing contingency is waived, the appraisal will still have weight. So if it comes in less than value or if it comes in with conditions, the buyer still is not gonna be out their earnest money but it's just saying, hey, at this time in the transaction, all the finances should be taken care of, the rates should be locked in. So we need to give a little bit more, um, a little bit more confidence so the seller knows that this will be able to close. Box number two, what is happening? Box number two is the automatic waiver of financing. Now this is a more, um, it's a more aggressive approach. It's definitely more competitive. If you have a buyer with financing, this puts no action into the seller's hands, but rather automatically waives the financing protection after the 21 days. 
Keep in mind, if you want to keep the appraisal, make sure you check the box that it will not constitute a waiver of paragraph five. So delivering the 22 AR, sometimes this form can seem a little bit scary. Um, luckily, the wording was changed, so it no longer says anything is being terminated, but it is the seller's notice. The seller has a right to send this notice. So how are you advising them as their broker? How are you advising them as their listing broker? Well, you should be letting them know in every transaction, whether they choose to exercise this or not, that on the 21st day, they do have the right to ask the buyer to waive their financing contingency. You'll want to go ahead and check box one, sending it over, seller's notice to perform. Um, it does in transaction desk auto populate the seller's notice of termination. So if you want to remove that box before you send it over to the buyer, that's just fine as well. Now, how we deliver this and how we say this are going to make a big difference. Sometimes this form can keep, seem kind of scary, um, but really all it is, is the seller asking that buyer to just give the confidence they need that their financing is in fact going forward and everything is moving smoothly. So as a buyer, when you receive this type of thing, how are you talking, or sorry, as a buyer's agent, how are you talking to your buyers about this? Are you creating a fear with your buyers or are you just letting them know that this is the seller's right to know that we are confident that we'll be able to close this transaction? What this form does is it removes that umbrella of protection for that financing to, to go through by closing. Again, we don't waive the appraisal just because we signed this form, but it does create a, it removes a safety net of having the approval for the financing. If you're a buyer, you might want to also make sure that there's nothing that's missing, um, that the underwriter might be asking for later that may come up, um, nothing that you forgot to give that lender, um, making sure that you've done everything you should have to provide the lender with everything they need to know. Paragraph three is for loan cost provisions. So these are closing costs that are awarded to the buyer. Um, now there is a limit on the amount of closing costs that can be put in here, and it's all going to be dependent on the type of loan and how much of a down payment is being put on. So if you want to know how much your buyer is allowed to receive, you may wanna to speak to your lender before you put a number in there. Everything that goes over the limit will actually just go back right into the seller's hands. Also, if you're putting agent compensation anywhere in your contract, make sure you don't put it in the loan cost provision because it does put it elsewhere in the HUD statement. So this is one of the only or very few contingencies that a seller does have some power. It's um, one of the few contingencies that a seller has the right to terminate. Not really any other place in our transactions do sellers have that sort of right. So when delivering this, um, we want to just kind of keep that in mind. We want to give the seller the opportunity to make the decision. Um, if for some reason they feel that this transaction is not going smoothly, if there's a buyer in backup position that may seem a little more confident, we want to make sure that we're communicating with the sellers that they have the right to do this. Um, so they may have the chance to kind of keep that buyer that's in backup position. Now, You'll have to strategically think about how that's going to work. Do you actually have somebody in a backup position? Is it better just to wait it out and see what happens? That's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. But the ways to terminate for financing are very specific. It's not just a, you know, get out of jail free card here. So in order to terminate with the financing contingency, you're going to need to prove the day the buyer made application for the property, make sure it was within those five days. Um, or if it was not, you know, it's automatically waived. You'll want a copy of the loan statement that was provided to the buyer from the lender. The buyer has to have had enough money to close, including all down payment and closing costs. 
And then the lender does need to write the reason they were unable to obtain the financing. So if the seller initiates the termination, then the buyer does get their earnest money back. You will retain the appraisal provision if you have not waived it. So the way that looks, and it'll be explained in other classes in greater detail, but when an appraisal comes back low, the buyer is the first one to give notice of low appraisal. The seller does have the right to respond by either doing a reconsideration of value, reducing the price, um, or just rejecting the whole idea. Once that seller does decide, the buyer has the chance for a final reply to that. The seller can, or the buyer can accept what the seller has to say. They can agree on their middle ground of a purchase price, or they can get out of the contract. Um, the only provision to this is if they're using a VA loan or an FHA that has an amendatory clause stating they don't have to pay a um, an, any amount over a um, appraised value, it just is an escape clause to not obligate them to make the purchase. They still have the decision to if they choose. Now, the one thing that's really great is even if Financing has been waived. Um, if the appraisal comes back in, even at value, but has a list of conditions that need to be done before it can be financed, uh, there is a clause in here that basically allows work order to be complete. Now, if work orders are called out by the lender, the seller has the choice to complete them or not. The seller is not obligated to complete them and not obligated to pay for them either. If the seller chooses not to complete them and the buyer cannot close, then the buyer will get their earnest money back even if the financing is waived, as long as they have still retained that appraisal provision. There are protections, like I said, with um, FHA, VA, USDA, um, that say that the the buyer is not obligated, no matter what the rest of the contract says, to pay over the appraised value. Again, they can choose to pay over the appraised value, but they are not obligated. It's an escape clause for these two types of loans. When we use the financing contingency, we also need to keep in mind, especially when we're representing a seller, that we are already giving permission for lenders to do any sort of inspections that need to be done. This, the lenders have the right to any inspection they need, such as pest, uh, roof, electrical, um, you name it. If they ask for it, the buyer and seller have already agreed that it's going to be allowed so whether this contingency is waived or not, the, the lender still gets the right to come in and perform the inspections that they need. Now, those are not gonna be out of the pocket of the seller, of course, but the seller does need to allow access so those can be completed. So some things you might wanna just keep in mind when you think about the financing contingency. There is no way to waive an appraisal while keeping the financing contingency. If the buyer is denied financing for the type they've noted in the contingency and then applies for another type, the financing contingency will protect them for the denial of the type they wanted to apply for in the first place. Um, they have technically met their obligation to apply as they promised they would. Um, there's no need to get permission once that's done. If they've applied, been denied, they can reapply for something else without permission. Changing the financing type without permission in this is a waiver of the contingency protection at any time after mutual acceptance, unless they have already been denied for the financing they applied for. Even if waived, the seller agrees to allow appraisals, bank inspections, et cetera, as needed by the lender. A loan denial does not end the transaction 
nor does it obligate the buyer to give notice to the seller. Keep this in mind when you represent a seller. Delivering the 22 AR is the only way to get information you need to your seller. Do not use the 22A and the 22EF to disclose the same loan. One of these is a contingency and one of these is a disclosure. They have different outcomes. They have different obligations. So if you are planning on using this as a protection, make sure you're using the contingency and not just disclosing. Disclosures do not offer your buyer any protection. A buyer not liking their monthly payment is not the same thing as a loan denial if the buyer is still qualified for the payment. So get your buyers pre-approved before you go under contract. Make sure they're happy with their payment because as long as they are approved, they can't use this as a way out. The seller may give notice to perform on day 21. So whatever the date is listed, it is on that date that they're allowed to send that notice. If there is an interest rate hike and the buyer no longer wants to purchase, they are not protected under the financing contingency if they are qualified for the payment still. Any closing costs awarded to the buyer that exceed the amount allowed by the lender will go back to the seller. The buyer is only allowed so much at closing. Make sure you talk to the lender about how much that is based on their loan type and their down payment. The lender who wrote the approval is not the lender the buyer has to use. So if they change it in those first five days, there's no penalty. If you or your seller have a preference, think about counter offering to use the lender they've specified in their letter. I appreciate you listening. I hope this was a valuable information for you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.